Hello, and welcome to the Adventures in Arting podcast, where we analyze, explore, and celebrate the creative journey. My name is Julie Fafan Balzer, and I am a working artist living outside of Boston. I've been hosting this podcast with my super special co-host and my mom, Eileen Shue Balzer, since 2012. Hi, Mom. Hi, Julie. So before we start, a couple things of note. You can check out monthly membership at balsdesigns.com. Membership offers a diverse array of classes, tutorials, vlogs, and art inspiration for artists at all levels. Um, and also you can check out, of course, tons and tons of online classes as well. All of that at balsdesigns.com. And of course, I hope you will. So today, this is episode 147. I have tentatively titled it, Putting Yourself Out There. Um, and, you know, putting yourself out there really refers to the various strategies that artists use to gain exposure, to connect with audiences, to advance your career, whatever that is. Um, and thinking about some ways to make the process of putting yourself out there easily or just like much easier, especially if you're an introvert or insecure. So I will just speak from personal experience and say that a lot of people always think I'm an extrovert because I can be very friendly and sort of, you know, perform uh, on cue when it need to. But I think I have always thought of myself as being more on the shy end and I do a lot of fake it until you make it stuff. My natural tendency is always to hang back in a group, never to step forward, never to, you know what I mean? Like I don't want to go to a party and have to deal with strangers and you know, all that kind of stuff. So putting yourself out there can refer to that kind of networking stuff, but it can also refer to a lot of things that are like putting your artwork online. It's doing those things where you might get hurt. I mean, that's, I guess the easiest way to define it. It's, and I think it's different for everyone. For some people, it's really easy to do, you know, certain aspects of putting it out there. And for other people, you know, the, that those parts may be hard and that's where you have to figure out what does sort of putting yourself out there mean to you. So I've divided this podcast into two parts. The first part is sort of talking about the ways in which um, artists might find it useful to put themselves out there, whether you're a professional or amateur artist or sort of wherever you are. Um, and then the second half is talking about ways to make it easier to do it. So mom, okay, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Let's just start there. I think like you, I'm an introvert, but sometimes people think I'm an extrovert because I can talk. I can hold a conversation with a stranger because uh, I've learned that trick of asking them about themselves. Everyone <laughs> willing to talk about themselves. But uh, I think my natural inclination is introvert. Yeah, I think that I've always heard it that it's not that being an introvert versus an extrovert is whether being with people energizes you, then you're an extrovert, or whether being with people sort of drains you, that's an introvert. And I need a certain amount of alone time. It's not that I don't enjoy the company of other people and all that kind of stuff, but I do find that I need a certain amount of like recovery time, which is why I believe in my heart that I am an introvert. But who knows? I will say that. I won't make a blanket statement about myself that being with people drains me or energizes me because it depends on the people. That's also true. That's also true. Okay. So let's talk about the ways in which an artist, one, I might want to put, uh, you know, myself out there. Okay. So the, the obvious way in this day and age is online, right? So that could be a website, you know, that showing off your portfolio of work, your biography, your contact information, upcoming events, that kind of stuff. It could be on social media platforms, sharing your work, engaging with followers, making videos. You know, there's a lot of sort of angry talk online I see about people who don't want to make videos and feel that they're being forced to make videos in order to make their social media accounts work and all that kind of stuff. And I think in the long run, I'll just say this. This is where I come down on it, which is in the olden days, before social media, you would have been forced to do a lot of things to toady in front of people to get them to choose your work to put in, you know what I mean? Like this, you have the ability to get yourself out there in front of people. And then I think a lot of people also conflate um, 
like having to go viral in something with putting yourself out there and like being able to promote your business. And I just don't think that it's true because I would say that I have learned that there's a huge difference between people who uh, like watch the videos I make or look at the pictures I make as entertainment content versus the people who are actually seeking the services I offer or want to buy artwork for me. So I, I don't feel the need anymore. This is a big 2024 change for me to service those people who want to do things for entertainment, you know, who are not actually interested in sort of like the nitty gritty of it or who aren't really interested in, in buying a class or who aren't particularly interested in buying artwork from me or having, you know, a relationship or a conversation, but it's just like scrolling entertainment. And you have to want the people who just want scrolling entertainment in order to get those really big numbers, like a million views, 2 million views. You also have to have something that's really um, content everybody can get behind. So that's why like really embarrassing things, pranks, car wrecks, um, dancing, fashion, like those are the things that attracts the most eyes. If you're making little art videos, you're going to get some, you know, but it's not going to be the same thing. So all of that was a long-winded way of saying, I think social media is an opportunity and not a burden. And I think that you don't need to do things that don't fit who you are in order to be on social media. Well, let's that, even that, flip that around and more and say, yeah. you have to define to whom you are trying to appeal and for what purpose, because you're not trying to appeal to everybody and you're not, and you don't, are you trying to get more eyes? Are you trying to get sales? Are you trying to get shows? What are you trying to right. do? So before you even make the video, you need to think about those two things. Who are you, whom are you trying to reach and for what purpose? Right. Cause if you think about it, as they always say, like, Instagram followers, YouTube watch, like those are vanity metrics. For the most part, they don't actually translate into a lot of things that are useful. Now in our little niche of art, let's just get honest. There are people who have work in the Whitney. There are people who have work at MoMA. There are people who are like selling their work for $20,000 a painting who have very small social media numbers. And there are people who cannot support themselves who have hundreds of thousands of followers. That's just a fact. You know, it again comes down to like, you know, so I listen to a lot of financial podcasts because I'm interested in business. And on one of them, uh, the NPR Marketplace podcast, the guy who hosts it, he always says, the stock market is not the economy. So if the stock market's up, it doesn't actually mean that the economy is up because the stock market doesn't represent the economy. It represents a very small subset of people, right, who have money invested in the market. And so uh, you cannot say, make decisions about the economy or uh, generalizations about the economy just based on how the stock market is doing that day, right? Or even, you know, as a whole, how the stock market's doing. So I, I think, like, again, you have to say, like, the stock market is not the economy. Followers, again, are so somewhat meaningless. Like they have that same thing where you want to say like followers are not the economy. Like they're just a benchmark, but they don't necessarily equate, you know, uh, success in your job or financial success or any of those things. Uh, and then I also wanted to say, and the reason I say that is not to put anybody down. I mean, I work at growing my social media following all the time because I think it's, you know, for me, it's important for, uh, I'm trying to grow my business and the more people that I can touch, I feel better. And you're probably the same way. But I say that because I think one of the things that stops people from posting, that scares people, that inhibits them from putting themselves out there is the feeling that like they don't have enough followers or nobody's paying attention or it feels very much like spitting into the wind or like there's just nothing there into the great void. And I've always said, and I think it's true that like 10 really loyal followers are better than a thousand people who don't really pay attention to you. And that's totally true. I know people who have incredibly dedicated small followings and people who have huge followings and nobody can like remember their name. They're not a priority, all that kind of stuff. You'd always rather be, you know, important to a couple of people who are important to you. Okay. Well, this leaves me just to make an ancillary comment. 
which is that at some point, if you're really serious about using followers, you need some way to measure the data about who stays with, how many people stay with you, what are their backgrounds, what other things are they interested in, etc. So not every follower is the same. You know, is having, for your business, is having 10,000 people 13 years old as good as maybe having, as you say, the 10 people who are older who buy art, who go to museums? I mean, it's just, mm-hmm. it's not the same. Right. That's the thing. Like, it's it's not a good fit. And the same thing would be true if, like, you had a friendship group that was 100 people. It would be really hard to get close to all 100 people. If you have a friendship group of five people, you probably are pretty close to everybody in the group, you know? Um, anyway, so the last sort of online way to put yourself out there is with a newsletter or a blog or something like that to connect with other artists and potential clients. So these are all different ways you can put yourself out there. And again, just online, whether you're professional or not to like help people. Why do you want to put yourself out there? Because you want to connect with others. You want to show your work to people. You want to, you know, in some way or another, uh, say, Hey, you know, I'm here. This is what I do. Well, what um, I, again, I, want- I interject yeah. all the time, but it's making me think things like, um, first, I think measuring somebody's appeal as an artist by followers on Instagram, for example, or former Twitter is like saying how good of an artist this person is, I will measure by how much money they're making because mm-hmm. it's it's not a one to one uh thing and then the other thing is when you want to i would just uh, say jeff coons is like the most like the highest paid artist right now in america without question and i hate everything he's ever made with a passion so I'll just cancel my birthday gift then. exactly uh, one of the th- other the other thing is to uh Talk about, again, getting some data because you have to define who you're going after and then see if that market is responding to you. That is the only group of people that you really need to be concerned about at the beginning. It is. If you're not reaching thinking. the very people who are your market, then mm-hmm. uh, it's a lot of wasted effort unless Even you change your idea who your market is. Well, what I was going to say is even if it's not a job, because we keep saying market as if everybody's a professional artist, but they're not. So even if it's a hobby, like you have to think about who do you want to connect with on social media? And, you know, if you want to connect with dog lovers because you love dogs too, then you better post a lot of pictures of dogs. If you want to connect with people who, you know, like making uh, you know, watercolor, then you probably post a lot of watercolor. If you like want to connect with people who do a range of that stuff. I mean, that's, I think a lot of times when you think about why you're posting, that may be a better way of put it is like, are you trying to sell something? Are you trying to just make friends? Are you trying to have a online portfolio? Are you trying, you know what I mean? Like what, why are you doing it is, I guess, a good question to ask yourself almost at every point. Uh, when you do almost anything. Yeah, it goes for any business too. I mean, part of it is a business decision. You have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of energy. So you don't want to spend it spinning your wheels and putting out tons of content that isn't going to reach the very group that you're trying to reach. Agreed. Speaking of which, uh, another way to put yourself out there is art exhibitions. So you can participate in local, national, international art exhibitions. Um, And these can include things like galleries, art associations, art fairs, open studios, juried exhibitions, whatever it is. A lot of these you need to apply for. Some of them you just need to like pay a fee to participate, but some of them you need to apply for. And then, you know, people will say whether you're jurid in or sometimes a gallerist or curator can approach you to be part of an exhibit or to have a show somewhere. Um, but that leads to, you really have to put yourself out there for networking. Most things that people get, I mean, we were just talking about this. So my husband, Steve is about to graduate from college 
And um, we were talking to him because we were talking about like submitting resumes and stuff. And I, you know, and uh, the general consensus among almost everybody we've spoken to is that you get a job based on who you know. So like it could be a casual relationship, but it's like someone you know has says there's an opening and they sort of send your resume onto somebody more than like a cold call. Right. And that makes sense in the same way that like you are more likely to that's a whole MLM theory. That's the whole like all that stuff, which is because, you know, somebody personally, you're more likely to buy from them. So you're more likely to hire them from them. So networking is probably one of the biggest putting yourself out there things. And that can be a reason to go online, too. You don't even need to be regularly posting to do that. You could be putting yourself out there by commenting to people you want to be friends with. OK, I'm going to tell you a secret, which is not going to be a secret okay. after I say this. So th uh, there's an artist that I discovered online today and I looked and she said Cambridge and Ipswich is where she, you know, hangs out and I live right near Cambridge and I loved her work. And then I looked online and she has, you know, one kid who looks like she could be my kid's age ish and she just had another baby. And I like had this overwhelming impulse to just DM her and be like, Hey, we're complete strangers. <laughs> I just saw your account. I love your work. I love that you're a mom who, you know, of a young kid, you know, making your way. It's hard obviously to juggle it all, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, is that like a creepy, is that a creepy email to get or not? I don't know. Ask yourself if someone wrote that to you, would you, how you would feel about it? Would you respond or not? Because I guess everybody is aware of the fact that the person writing to you could not be what they represent. Right. This could I mean, be I'm, a, you know, right. I'm not again. saying like, let's meet up and I can eat your liver. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was like, I think if somebody wrote to me and just said, just wanted to just like say, Hey, or something like that, I would totally be like, Oh, that's great. Nice to meet you. And if I liked their work, I'd follow them back and just sort of see, do you know what I mean? Where time took us, so to speak. I'm just saying, yeah. I think, again, you risk being an annoyance or re having rejection. But if it's someone you really think uh, you admire their work and you might have something in common and you might run into them somewhere, the other thing is to tuck it away, mm -hmm. the name. And then if you ran into them, you could say, oh, I follow you and I thought of DMing you but I didn't want to think I didn't want you to think I was going to eat your liver <laughs> I mean I think so I would find that creepier that to me is more stalkery if I meet somebody in person and they know me from online but we've never had any interaction and they're like you know I never comment and I never say anything but I watch you like no, I think that is a generational thing it's just like sometimes creepy. I want to call someplace to get information and you mm -hmm. want to text Yes. And I would sometimes rather stick a pencil in my eye than have an endless text conversation with a bot. And you would rather stick a pencil in your eye than pick up the phone and dial a number. Have an endless conversation with an incompetent human at the other end. Yeah. Well, I mean, I assume I think... it will be that. It might be a really wonderful person who knows exactly what I need and can handle it. I, right. I just feel like it's a generational thing. I don't find it, it creepy. Well, I mean, I think then that's one of the other things, which is putting yourself out there, which is, you know, I think that it would be totally that a way to put myself out there would be that I would feel comfortable with would be to DM this person. It would feel a little bit brave because I don't generally DM people out of the blue. But on the other hand, I feel like approaching them in public somewhere to me would be way creepy. Them to me, it's that you happen to be at the same event. And right. then you it's still way creepy, still way. Creepy. Well, I'm going to just say, uh, I find that the old fashioned way is sometimes the better way. It's very natural. Yes, you, you do. Boomer. I'm sure that that's true. Uh, this is You're this not is looking to date this person. No. And I think like that's that in the end is what stopped me because I was like, it would be one thing if I was like, Oh, I feel like there's a connection and I'm having a meetup. Do you know what I mean? With a bunch of other artist moms, if you'd like to come or there was nothing to say other than it was kind of like a fan letter just to say, I really liked your work. Oh, and I, I was excited to comment. see this. I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. something. And I maybe did. this person will put on your comment and look up your, your. I understand. I'm not like an idiot about this. What I'm saying is like, I'm this was. Idiot. What I'm saying is that. You don't need to assume that approaching some, I mean, 
Don't you like it when somebody writes and says, I love your work? Yeah, I do. That's why I thought about saying something to her. But then I was like, in the end, I was like, I don't have anything to say that's like particularly, do you know what I mean, thoughtful or different. So I just left some likes on her work, you know, okay. picked out a piece that I liked a lot and said, oh, I really, you know, and said something specific about it. And then, you know, followed her and that was it. But I mentioned it because I think like, I'm not the only one who's had this conversation. I'm not the only one who wondered, should I say this or not? And like in the grand scheme of things, I probably ought to write her a DM fan letter because there's nobody who I think, unless you're saying something that's super weird in it, would be offended by saying, hey, I stumbled into your account today by accident. Love your artwork. I also have a young child. Go you you know, making art and being a mom at the same time is like, is hard to do. And that's fantastic. Why does you know? it have to be like a DM and not just a comment? Why can't you write that exact same comment as a comment? Because I don't want to. Yeah. But you should look at why. <laughs> well, I think like when I look at why I don't want to leave that comment, she's not writing anything personal on her painting. She's just like, Hey, I'm having a, painting sale. I don't know. It's weird to me. It's like, it's the same thing as like, would I scream across the street? Uh, leaving a comment to me is like screaming across the street at somebody. Hey, you look great today. Has that it's never fine. happened to you? But like, yes, it has. It, okay. There were some other words in there that I didn't like as much, but yes, I'm a woman living in a world in which men. That's why you think it's creepy. Okay. So, uh, networking, let's talk about what that is. So you can creepily approach somebody who you follow and have never commented on and tell them, I watch you all the time. Um, that's one way to network. Um, you can obviously attend art related events, openings, workshops, conferences, all these kinds of things to meet other people. And that could be collectors, gallery owners, curators, other artists, industry professionals, service people, like whatever it is that you're looking for to kind of meet. I think the thing with all of that in-person networking is always to remember that even though we all understand that it's for promotional purposes, so to speak, some of it, like most good relationships are based on actual relationship and connection and not on some sense of like trying to be sold on something. And I will give another example, which is there's a woman who I don't know very well um, but I have run into her. She added me to her mailing list without my telling her to do it. And she doesn't have an unsubscribe button, right? Cause she doesn't use like an official mailing service or whatever. It's just like an email that comes. So I would have to write directly back to her and say, unsubscribe me, which just feels rude because I basically have a social relationship with her. You, you know? delete her? Just huh? delete her. Delete can I her what? site? Delete her site. When somebody sends you an email, they send you an email. Like okay. it just is what it is, right? You can't do anything mute about her? it. You, what? you would have to mute you can't her. Mute somebody in email. It just it just is, right? I mean, I could block her entirely, but we are in some groups, do you know what I mean? In which her email address would still be coming into my inbox. So it's a, it's a difficult situation. And like, I find that any interaction I have with her she is like incredibly self-promotional for her. Okay. And so I have no sense, my only sense of her as a human being is that she's aggressively self-promoting, right? And that she's only interested in me if I can offer her an opportunity. And so okay. personally, that turns me off a lot. I think there are other people who probably see it as like being a real go getter and like good for you and like asking for what you want. And I think she gets a lot of opportunities, you know, because she's the first one to say, I'll do it. I want to do it. How do I do this? Let me do it. You know what I mean? Her. So why wouldn't she keep doing it? Exactly. And so I think like that goes back to you. There's not a right and a wrong way to do it. You have to do what feels comfortable to you. And remember that the people who are attracted to your style of being, of networking, of whatever it is, are going to be attracted to it. And the people who aren't are going to be repulsed by it. And that's just, that's you know it. what I mean, what it is. But I think, again, it's like, remembering that building relationships and fostering connections is really about what leads to 
collaborations, commissions, exhibition opportunities, like all of those kinds of things. You have to put yourself out there. But I, I think have, that's, uh, that's putting mm -hmm. all the onus on, you put yourself out there and then people come to you. But there's also the factor of finding a way to approach people that works for you. Because you can't just sit around and wait for people to approach you. I do think this, which is that sometimes people don't want to think that art is a business. If you're just a casual hobby artist, it may not be a business to you. But you're a working artist. And I think it is a business. You're supporting your family with this. So it ha there has to be an, a little tiny soupçon of business in all the ways you spend your time because that is how you grow your business. Well, I think of it a, a little bit like a trade show. So for yeah. many years, I worked trade show floor. And one of the rules of thumb when you're not a buyer at a trade show is that you don't dominate somebody's time in a booth. So if I were working in a booth and I had a break and I was walking around, I might see a product that interested me. But as soon as the salesperson would come over, I would say, oh, I'm not a buyer. I'm, you know, I'm an artist. I'm working in that booth. And I just, this is really cool. And then that would give them the opportunity to either walk away and deal with somebody who's an actual buyer or to, to ha say like, I've got the time. I'll tell you about it. Cause you might be like an end consumer do you know what I mean? Or it might be a good relationship. Maybe they're looking for an artist who's interested in this product or whatever it is. And that's a way that you can make, I think, some relationships, you know, based on being about your, yeah, yeah. About your motives. Being honest that's and upfront right. about why you're there and who you are, that you're not aspirating and remembering that you're not wasting somebody's time. I think the same thing happens to me sometimes at art fairs, which is actually one of the things we're going to talk about next. Because there will be people who come who want to be social, who, you know, know you. They're not going to buy anything. But the problem in the booth is they're taking your time. And so then a buyer is not necessarily showing up. So it's not that every opportunity needs to be, like, transactional. But I do think when you're trying to build a relationship with somebody, if you're trying to build a relationship with somebody, you need to be conscious of, like, what they want out of this experience as well as what you do as they always say like the best deals are the one where everybody gets something that they want not just one person walks away with whatever it is that they wanted you know and so that's why i think the like comic con and all that kind of stuff like works so well and is so popular because it's not it's a moment when celebrities literally are there just to sign things literally are there just to meet with fans like that's what they want out of the experience and what you want out of the experience so it's like a win-win you know that's why meet and greets i think are popular because again it goes back to it's not a coming out of the stage door the celebrity doesn't have time is like busy doing you a favor it's a they're there for the meet and greet just to see you greet you all that kind of stuff well, this goes to another issue, a side issue again, where you've done some art shows uh, where you've realized that it, this art show is not attracting people who want to buy art. It's, act, it's attracting people who just want to go to an art show, spend a pleasant you know, weekend afternoon and uh, talk to some people. So then you've made the decision, well, I won't do this show again because the people who come are not really buyers. And uh, it's not that you don't enjoy talking to people about what you do, but you haven't got the bandwidth to do that on a regular basis. You really, right. the effort, time, and stress of putting together a booth requires that you uh, sell things. It just does. Yeah. So, I mean, let's talk about selling opportunities. So there are lots of them for artists, right? There's art fairs and markets, those in-person things that where you can, you know, get exposure, allow you to engage with your, with art enthusiasts face to face. You often can talk to people and understand in person what they like or don't like about what you're presenting. 
Um, online marketplaces are great too. Platforms like Etsy or your own website to sell your work. It is hard to put your work out there. That's a very naked thing. You can also have art gallery representation that can help you sell your work to a wider audience, people that you don't know or don't have access to. It can reduce the amount of legwork that you need to do. They also take usually about half the money that you make, or they take half the price of the artwork. Um, and I think like selling opportunities are again, always a thing, which is, I don't think that all artists have to sell their work. I don't think all artists have to be interested in sales. I think it is one way and one thing that some artists are interested in. And if you are, it is very vulnerable to put your work out there for sale because you, I think a lot of times, you know, it's like, do people think I'm good enough? Are they, is it going to be okay? Do you, and a lot of like people say. It's a competitive environment with the other people who are showing. It is, but it's, that's, but it's also like, I think it's, um, people want to think that other people like their work enough to pay money for it. It's a deeply flattering thing. And so if people don't, it can actually go the other way too. So that's just to think about it. And that's why I think it can sometimes feel a little awkward. So speaking of competition, I mean, there are art competitions and awards. You can submit your work to art competitions, to grants, to awards, and these all get you recognition, validation, exposure within the arts community. Um, winning and being shortlisted for like a really prestigious competition of some kind can really boost your visibility and credibility as an artist. If you win the Turner Prize, I'll be very impressed with you. Um, art residencies are kind of the same thing in some ways, meaning like there are some prestigious residencies that will make a big you know, difference in the way that people look at you or think of you. And other art residencies can be great just because you're seeking community and networking with other artists, you know, a, a place to explore new ideas and techniques. For a long time, I thought of art, artist residencies as just like time to yourself. And then I talked to a bunch of artists who had been on a number of residencies and what they said, like, well, there is that, but it's really about like, Having a cohort of people to intensely, it's like drop into, of to ping off of, to meet, to know, to network. It's more about, it's kind of like why people say to go to business school, which is not necessarily what you learn. It's the people that you meet that can help you later in your life, you know? And so that's why I think a lot of people are specifically interested in art residencies. I will just say there personally for me, like if you want to pay a lot of money to go to an artist residency, that's fine, but just beware because I think there are some ripoffs out there of people who just want to take your money but not nurture or help you in any way. So just beware. Um, art public publications and press, press features, interviews, reviews, just publishing your art in a magazine, like all that stuff can help generate interest in your work. Again, reach a larger audience. It can help establish your reputation. Um, you can submit your work. You can send out press releases. You can reach out to culture writers, like all that kind of stuff. I will say that. Um, the way that this started to be a job for me was many years ago, probably 20 years ago, um, I was a scrapbooker and I wanted to be published. And they said, you know, you could submit your work to this magazine. And I thought, ah, oh, no problem. I'll submit my work to this magazine. And I got rejected time after time after time. And I was so mad because I was like, why isn't my work good enough? That I sat down to understand why it wasn't good enough. And of course, I can see all the reasons it wasn't good enough. Uh, I couldn't see it at the time. It was very hard, right? Because at, at the time, I, it's like, I'm trying to think how to put it. I was doing the best that I could, and I couldn't tell how my best was different than these other pieces, which is why it was the best I could do. It's not like I was just satisfied with the work I was sending in. I really thought it was as good as the stuff I was seeing. But I can look back now and be like, really missed the mark on that. Uh, and I think like that, that's great because that's growth, but it also, it's hard to get rejections. It's painful to get rejections. It is really putting yourself out there, but it can be really exciting um, when you get that. A lot of things that have happened to me happened because I was published in a lot of scrapbooking magazines and then it delved into mixed media stuff. And I ended up having a column in cloth, paper, scissors, and it just sort of snowballed into a lot of different opportunities. So it can be great if you can get that, that all that press stuff. Um, collaborations and partnerships. So you can collaborate with other artists, with designers, with brands. You see a lot of that with artists now. 
um, like customer work on a can and stuff like that. Organizations, creative projects, exhibitions, like all that kind of stuff. And collaborations can introduce your, to you to new audiences and create opportunities for cross promotion, right? This, um, you could collaborate with, if you're a 2D artist, you could collaborate with a sculptor. So then like maybe the sculptor's audience is bringing you in, you know, and the 2D audience that you have is crossing over to the sculptor and, you know, you find some like people and it offers you a way to broaden people are out there, but you have to put yourself out there to get a collaboration, to say to somebody, do you want to collaborate with me? Would you ever be interested in doing, you know, a show together or a vlog together or like whatever it is? Would you want to do a, you know, round robin art journal, something like that? Um, artist talks, workshops, lectures, all this kind of stuff. And it can be at a gallery, a TED talk, or it can be a community center, it can be whatever, to sort of share your creative process, your insights, and your expertise with others. Um, and if you engage audiences in these kind of learning environments, I always think that it really deepens connections and it fosters appreciation for your work in a different way because people start to understand the sort of behind the scenes stuff. So that's kind of the long list of the ways that I think that artists might want to put themselves out there. And again, I think putting yourself out there in terms of what it means is accepting sort of the way that you feel vulnerable about sharing things with other people or approaching a stranger or any of that or uh and being okay with that vulnerability or at least doing it even though you're scared faking it till you make it mom can you well, think of a, any i was gonna say I think this is applicable to so many different areas of life, not just trying to put your art out there. Because the idea is if you don't put it out there, you will never know what other people think. If you don't care what other people think then, uh, and you don't want to risk a negative experience, then don't do it. But if you are genuinely curious about what other people think about it, if you have the ability to uh, learn, and listen in a non-defensive way and see if there's a nugget to glean from it. If you uh, are able to consider the source so you don't necessarily assume that all critique is the same, you don't give everything the same weight, but the people whose opinion you respect, uh, you can accept or at least listen to, then those are things you need to put your art out there for. It's like, if you write a play and you never, no one ever sees it, you never mount a production. I mean, how do you know how the audience is going to receive it? Plays have pre-opening runs for the very reason, but even before that, they have readings. They have ses sessions with groups of people to see whether it's going to be positively or negatively received. Are they going to laugh at this thing? where they're supposed to or where they're not supposed to, uh, you know, movies Although I have. Would say, I would say like plays and movies, in my opinion, are made to have the audience as a part of it. I don't there know. Just for yourself, you don't need to do this. Right. And But if you want to paint paintings that speak to people and communicate what you're feeling, then maybe you should see, are you communicating what you want to communicate? And have you found the right, audience the right people you know for this conversation it's it's not an all or nothing and it's not a hard and fast rule but you need to think about why is it so hard for you to put yourself out there is it because you are insecure enough that any criticism no matter how off the mark no matter from whom uh will devastate you then that's one thing but if you, there are people you, whose opinions you, you'd like to seek out and see what they think, then I think you need to put yourself out there. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about some strategies to make it easier to put yourself out there. But I just wanted to say, so there was a comment on the Creative Why podcast that you made me think of. Um, and she says, your podcast was very insightful. Currently, I'm not at a stage to look too much into the whys of my art other than I enjoy being creative every day and I do not want to stop. I haven't missed a day since 1-1-2018. Oh, I found what wonderful. you and your mom... I found what you and your mom talked about useful for other areas of my life, aspirational, something to really think about. 
And again, like, I don't think, just like I don't think everybody needs to sell their work, I don't think everybody makes art for it to be seen. Sometimes art is a process, and it's just you enjoy mucking around in the process. But I do think that, like, putting yourself out there means that you want something from other people. So if the art is just for you and you don't want anything from other people, then I don't think you need to do it. And I'm not saying that everybody has to do it. But if you do want something, even if it's from your family, like, I want my family to respect what I do. And to not feel like it's a waste of time or money or anything like that, then you need to put yourself out there to show them why it matters to you. You need to put yourself out there, you know what I mean, to show them that you're getting better. It's doing something for you or whatever it is. Okay. So here are some strategies I think to make it easier to put yourself out there, or at least they're things that work for me. So the first is to start small. So begin by taking a small step out of your comfort zone, right? So for instance, you could share your work with close family. Uh, or friends uh, before showing it to a larger audience, you know, uh, and it's like gradually increasing exposure as you become more comfortable. You could apply not to... only excuse me, not close necessarily, because mm -hmm. some of your close family might not think what you do is particularly worthy. I would say to supportive family. Why start? Yes. With a blank slate, why not start with people who have supported you and your work? In the I guess past? I wouldn't call anybody close to me who wasn't supportive. Well, I think that's been a process. Nonetheless, I, then I would have just said, I would have just said family as opposed to close family, but it's all semantics. Yes, show it to people who you feel comfortable with before you do anybody else. You know, and I think it's it's the same, which is the opposite is true too, which is you need to start not showing it to people who make you feel bad about it, even if that's your partner or your parent or your child. You know, there was a woman who I coached for a while who was always made to feel terrible about her art by her siblings growing up. And she's now come to art later in life. And I think like, that's the thing you forget is how toxic some people can be about the things that you want. And so it's important to figure out like where is safe to put that. And that's the wonderful thing about online is you can often reach a community outside of your own. Um, focus on your strengths, you know, identify your strengths as an artist and leverage them in your interactions. Like if it's, it could be your style, your storytelling ability, your technical skills, you know, so as an example from art, like let's say you are a really good writer, fantastic writer. So you might think about does that mean like your Instagram captions are hilarious and fascinating? Does it mean that you would be really good at writing grant proposals or applications for residencies because you can write like nothing else, you know? Or maybe your skills are more like <clears throat> you are super into pop culture and you could always think of a pop culture reference for something. That's a wonderful personality quirk. Do you know what I mean? That you can easily create, you know, memes or other things that relate to people so that they'll get it, you know, or your artwork can reference pop culture things, be very in the moment. And I I think always like the easiest way to start getting comfortable putting yourself out there is to know that it's around something you do really well. Practice self-compassion. And this is about, again, as always, being kind to yourself, acknowledging that putting yourself out there can be daunting, reminding yourself that it's okay to feel nervous or insecure, and recognizing when you try things, right? So maybe it's even to like write down the small steps that you've taken. Like maybe you want to apply for a huge, you want to apply for, you know, what do you want to apply for? You want to apply for some sort of amazing award, but you know that you need to build up a little experience in the meantime. So you break it down into small steps. First, I'm going to get into this show. Then I'm going to, you know, do this. Then I'm going to do da, 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 da. And so what you need to do is like recognize every time you check something off. I am super guilty of as soon as something gets checked off, I focus on either that I didn't make the next hurdle or it was too easy to do that. So now I'm mad and I need to jump four levels or whatever it is. And I think it's important in this process of putting yourself out there to like pat yourself on the back. So the, for instance of this, as a practical example is, so at the beginning of 2024, I knew coming into 2024, my goal was that I wanted to put myself out there and apply to opportunities right? That's all I said to myself. I want to try to apply to opportunities in 2024. I want to apply at least two a month, quantifiable, right? And more than that, if I can. 
So in 2024, I've had an exhibit at my local library. I have been juried into uh, two different art association shows. I have artwork in an unjuried show, and I was asked to participate in a small group show at an art center near me. And that's amazing. It's February, my friends. This podcast yeah. is probably coming out a little bit later, but when we're recording it, it's February. And like, I'm incredibly proud that I put myself out there to do all those things. And yet, you know what I say to myself all the time? I'm like, well, it's just art associations. Well, you know, they took like 30% of the work that uh, the juries, you know, took 30% of the work that people submitted. So it's not like it was that hard or that great. Like that's, you know, and yet if I'd been rejected, I'm sure I would have been devastated. So I am the worst at doing the opposite of what I'm telling you to do, which is why I'm telling you to do it. Cause I say it to myself all the time. Like you have to be proud and recognize, like I've stuck to it. I've been applying, you know, I've gotten into things. That's fantastic. Like, great. Good for me. But I'm still, I still find a way to make it into a bad thing. Okay. I also, I just want to say the following. Yeah. Which may not apply to you, but I think applies a lot of times to people, which is don't confuse being bad at something with being a beginner. Yes. That stops you sometimes from learning. Mm -hmm. and growing what you can do, I think it stops, it inhibits people from trying sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, And the same thing is true when we make fun of people for being bad at things. You know? Oh, look at that. He can't do it, that. Or, oh, that she looks so stupid doing it. Or whatever it is. And, like, a lot of us do it unconsciously, or we have family members who do it unconsciously. And, like, it's terrible because it makes you feel like you can never be bad at anything. And then that's, that's a horrible thing, right? Okay. In fact, I will just say. Unless you're bad or inexperienced, unschooled. Right. I mean, right. That is such an, a sweeping word and it doesn't allow for you to ever get better. Okay. So set realistic goals. Uh, so this is again, like setting achievable goals for yourself. So if I was like, I want to have my work acquired by a museum, I'll be like, okay, Julie, we're going to need a couple years to get to that point, but <laughs> let's break that down into some steps we can actually do. Um, and, but I think like an achievable goal is like my thing of, I'm going to submit to at least two opportunities a month. That's achievable. I know I can do it. Everybody can sit down and submit twice a month. That basically requires like an hour or two of your time to find the calls, get the stuff together, write the application, whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? Um, It also, I'm going to say this, it requires developing your skills as a photographer of your work and having mm -hmm. some skill with the internet so you know how to get it up there in a way that other people can access it. And maybe improving your skills of writing, record keeping. So there's a lot yeah. of stuff involved with that. And you have to, so if you wanted to break it down even more, those are the beginning things you have to start with. It's true. Cause less. they always ask for an artist statement. They always yeah. ask for yeah. like, you know, and I've done that already. They always ask for pictures. I've already done that already. They always ask for, you know, you often have to resize the pictures. I know how to do that. So that stuff I take for granted because I already know how to do a lot yeah, of it. But, that, but it's not for some people. Mm -hmm. It might stop them, you know, right. and, and then the other piece of it is that's a way of breaking down the whole process mm -hmm. of being able to submit to, to, a, to a month to even smaller bites if you need mm -hmm. to, to develop those skills and that backlog of work so you can do that. Exactly. And the other thing is I think some people go crazy. So they'll be like, I'm going to post on social media seven days a week. And I'm like, really? You're going to post on social media seven days a week for the rest of your life? That's amazing and maybe a little bit exhausting. Um, so again, it's like, what is realistic for you now? What's your goal? What do you think the difference maker is going to be by posting seven times a week? Like, you know, are there tools that can help you? Like, so again, set a realistic goal for something you really think that you can do and that you can keep up with. That's the most important thing. Like if you're sick, are you going to do it? Are you going to have everything planned out for before you go to vacation? And then after you get back, are you going to, 
you know, if you have a real, is it the first thing you do every day? Like, how are you going to make sure that that really happens? Um, okay. Seek support. So this goes back to mom's point about surrounding yourself with supportive friends, family members, mentors, fellow artists who, you know, understand your struggles, can provide encouragement, constructive feedback, all that kind of stuff. Because I think having a support system can really bolster your confidence and motivation. Now, these don't have to be artists. They just have to be people who, when you say, I want to apply to be um, in an art show, they say, cool, you know, tell me more instead of, I don't really, your artwork, you know what I mean? Like you want people who are in your corner who want to help you. Um, practice self-promotion, not a four letter word, by the way, a lot more than four letters. Um, but practice talking about your artwork and your creative process until it feels more natural. You know, I do this with my coaching clients all the time and I'm sure they hate it, but I'm like, pitch me, tell me like, you know what I mean? To my face. Um, you can write down key points. This is not unlike preparing for job interviews. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't just go in cold because they're going to ask you to talk about things. You have to be prepared and to sell right. yourself and your skills and your experience. Why would you think that it would be any different right. for art? The first thing that people say to me, you know, in America, we often say to people like, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? It's a casual question that we just say almost immediately, right? So, and uh, I always say I'm an artist. And then the next question everybody asks You is, sell? Or where no. can I see you? No. Where can I see your art? No. What is say, it? What kind of art do you make? The same way that if somebody tells me they're a lawyer, I say, oh, what kind of law do you practice? Or a doctor? Oh, what kind of doctor are you? What kind of medicine do you practice? You know what I mean? Like, we like to figure it out if it's not sort of obvious. If, right. Even if somebody said, I'm a firefighter, you might say, oh, what station house are you at? Or what town do you work in? Right? It's like the natural follow-up question. And so I used to find it difficult to explain to people, partially because I used to say, oh, I'm a mixed media artist. And people who aren't artists are always like, what's... What's the, what's the, so I, that's part of the reason I finally figured out like, uh, and I would say to people, oh, I, I say I'm a painter or printmaker and a collage artist. And I often mix the three together. And then if they want to go from there, you know, I launch into a discussion of the fact that like my work is all about finding connections between disparate, you know, colors, items, shapes, all that kind of stuff to try to create a cohesive whole out of separate bits and pieces. And that sort of gives a really quick way into people understanding what it is that I do. Now, it's not a thesis statement. It's not like an enormous, like, you know, whatever, but I'm comfortable enough with it now to be able to spit that out casually in conversation and be able to talk about it as opposed to hemming and hawing and looking at the floor and giving, you know, a very long explanation when it should be a quick one. The same way that somebody might say, oh, I'm a cardiologist. I specialize in, you know, people who have gotten bad heart valves and are need to have a second surgery. Who knows? Do you know what I mean? But like, you get it. I don't, I don't. And if I'm actually interested in cardiology, I can go further with them. And if I'm not, I can be like, that's great. And we keep moving on, you know? Um, so find your comfort zone. So that's another thing. Identify settings or platforms. It could be an online setting, right? Where you feel more comfortable. Like Twitter is not for me or X or whatever it's called. I just feel like it's, there are too many mean people. And art is such a minor thing there. And I don't think my voice is right for Twitter. I am just not, it's like, a, it's like walking into a bar where everybody turns and looks at you. And I'm like, this is, this is not the bar I want to go to, you know? Um, but you should find the place you feel comfortable. And that feels like a nice environment for you. Um, and the same thing is true about like art events. So for instance, a friend of mine had an exhibit recently at a local gallery and there were basically like two opportunities to go see the show when she was definitely going to be there. And I would say she's not a friend friend. She's an acquaintance. Um, and one of them was the opening and one of them was the artist talk. And I knew immediately that I was not going to the opening because I was like, the opening will be hard because it will be the most number of people will go. It will be the least amount. It'll be the most time that people are looking for people that they know to talk to. And it will be hard to enter into a new conversation with somebody. But in an artist talk, A, I might learn something. So at the very least, I would learn about her process. Right. B, 
then there's something to talk about with people afterwards because we all heard the same artist talk and we can reference it, you know, and like have a conversation and see only people who are really interested in process go to artist talks. And that's probably my people as opposed to people who want to drink a free glass of wine, which is probably not my people because I don't drink. Right. So I'll tell you another thing. Yeah. One reason I like artist talks and this is apropos of nothing mm -hmm. is because I like to look at the art on exhibit and then listen to the artist talk and then see it through different eyes. Yeah. Yeah. I also just really enjoy artist talks, but again, like that's my, the people who are my people are people who would enjoy artist talks. So it makes sense to go to the artist talk because then I'm going to meet them. Right. Right. So that's again, like find the situation that's the most comfortable for you. And like the other thing is, I could have gone by myself, but Steve didn't want to go. So I was like, mom, I want you to come with me. Uh, and that's the other thing, which is it makes me as an introvert feel more comfortable to go with somebody else because then I know I'll have somebody else to chat with. You know what I mean? As opposed to having to totally be by myself, which then I would just be, I feel like I would, I sometimes put out like really nervous energy when I do that. Anyway, but it's about knowing yourself. Okay. Focus on connection. So this is, again, like, I think instead of being a self-promoter all the time, if you can, if you can focus on building some genuine connections with people who share interests, then I think opportunities come from that, which is to say, like, I'm sure you've seen it. If you if you walk into somewhere and the person is me, like, hey, I do life insurance. Do you have it? You know, you're immediately like, oh, I don't want to talk to this person. You know what I mean? But if they start off being like, oh, I see your shirt. I, I went to that school. Did you, you know, did you go and you have a conversation about that? Then you already feel like you're into something and you're ready to sort of, you know, keep going. And then when they call you in three weeks about life insurance, you're less angry. It's more like an MLM at that point. Um, so again, it's like focusing on the connections as opposed to just selling. And it's hard because a lot of times, like my mom has said a couple of times on the podcast, like I am the breadwinner for my family. I need this business to make money. So it's hard to, sometimes I want to, I don't want to do any self-promotion, but I am reminded that I need to do some of it in order to be able to do the rest of it, you know? And so it's like trying to find that right balance. And then finally, just taking breaks when you need. Like, I don't think you have to be at a hundred all the time. You don't have to put yourself right. out there every single day. And that is also the thing about setting realistic goals. If you need time to recover, it's like make a burst situation. This is the whole theory behind some of these people who say like businesses work in like a six week structure where they go hard for six weeks. And then there's like a week where everybody just takes a step back. Then they go hard for six because you can only maintain really pushing for a short period of time, right? That's the idea of a, you know, like those workouts where you're going really intensely running and then walking really intensely running as you need that break. And so what can you do for yourself? where you can put yourself out there in a certain way or for a certain period of time and then pull back from it or change your mind if it's not working. You know what I mean? If something about it is making you uncomfortable. So those are my ideas for how to make it easier. Do you have other ones, mom? Well, one of the things is from the point of going to this gallery talk also included, you want to show solidarity with some other artists because it's a reciprocal thing. You want to go to their gallery talks and then they'll come to yours, just like you want to comment on their Instagram and then they'll check you out and comment on yours. It's, you've got to keep in mind that you're constantly building this relationship, no matter how tenuous, of mutual support. Uh, and then the other thing is, be if you're just interested in other people, you don't have to always like, as you said, be right on the point that the high I'm selling life insurance. Be interested in other people. You may find out some fascinating stuff, and you may find that there are ways of connecting that ha that you hadn't realized. Mm -hmm. So you can listen too. I will always, and for the my the rest of my life, remember this quote. I have no idea where it came from, but it's such good advice which is be interested, not interesting. And I think it's such a good way to think about all sorts of networking, social interactions, all that kind of stuff. 
anyway, I hope that you will find a way to put yourself out there artistically or otherwise. It's important. Uh, a couple things to note before we go. Practical color for painters is ongoing. Color is a foundational part of making art. I read a great quote this week in a color book where they said, um, being an artist and not knowing about color is like going on vacation and leaving your suitcase at home. Like you can still go on the vacation, but like there's something wrong the whole time, right? Uh, in person this summer, I'm teaching Art Alchemy, Exploring Golden Brand Paints and Mediums. That's June 23rd through 25th. That's here at my cozy home studio outside of Boston. It's a personalized uh, art learning experience like no other. Class size is extremely small. Think like four people small. Uh, you get to meet some new art friends, spend a long weekend being pampered and fed, and expand your creative boundaries. So if you want to connect, you can find me at juliebalzer.com or all over social media as at Balzer Designs. Uh, you can't find mom, but I've been telling her we need you a podcast episode all about her, and hopefully she will work up the courage to allow us to do that. And I really hope you'll sign up for the free weekly newsletter. That's the best way to make sure that you keep up on the latest news. There's a big button on the homepage of juliebalzer.com where you can do that. Or you can go to the show page for this podcast to find the link. And if you'd like to help the show, you can leave a review, mention us on social media, tell a friend, because all of those things help other people find the show. So thanks so much for listening and subscribing. We'll see you the next time on the Adventures in Arting podcast.